as you saw in the video, in the 1980s, um, at least two million people were killed. Another five million were made homeless, and um, when people are made homeless in these dire situations, even more die. But in just the last four years during the Darfur situation, which is just a continuum of what's been going on all this time, it's just moved to the western part of the country, and I'll show you that. Um, nobody knows how many people have been killed. The most conservative estimate is 200,000, but that was actually adjusted down through some politics from what most people thought was more like 600,000. But I did hear on NPR earlier this week that three million people's homes have been burned to the ground and they've been run away and they're living in a very, very uh, bad situation. So what is going on there? Well, um, did you hear on the video a couple things they said about what caused this whole situation? I know there was a lot more interesting parts, the story of the boys, but they did mention a couple things. Did anybody notice that? Yes? It seemed like there was like some sort of a religious uh, sort of like battle or war or something Yeah. <laughs> An oversimplification, and I'll tell you why I say that, but uh, yeah, they said Muslims are killing Christians. Um, and they called it a civil war, right? Well, to me, um, it's about as much as a civil war as the Holocaust was, because when you have Antonov bombers and helicopter gunships and Kalashnikovs against farmers who only have spears for hunting gazelle and giraffe and uh, they mostly farm and keep cattle. That's not a civil war. That's an ethnic cleansing. And uh, a lot of people aren't even familiar with Sudan. You know, we don't hear much about it. I didn't know anything about it. Which is kind of strange because it's the largest country in Africa. So why is that true? Well, a lot of it has to do with the leadership. They don't want us to hear anything about it. Journalists take their life in their hands in that country. Uh, having a camera can be, could put you in prison and you'd be tortured. You may not emerge, you may never be seen again. Singing the wrong song can land you in prison as well. So there's great effort by these types of people to keep things secret. We know that's true in North Korea. Hardly anybody gets to go in to see what was going on. And if any of you have studied the Holocaust, you'll know that um, Hitler spent years preparing for what he finally did in the 40s. Um, the freedom of press, freedom of speech, and all those rights were removed from the people he wanted to oppress throughout the 30s. And uh, then in the 40s, he even had secret um, or special camps set up so that if the UN or people came, they could, he could show them to them and the people looked relatively fed and happy. So the same thing's happening in Sudan, and it's happening in other countries. What, why? Why does this happen? Well, um, for one thing, it's the legacy of colonialism. If any of you saw Hotel Rwanda, and I imagine some of you did because you're interested in this subject, the, um, the Tutsis were favored by the colonial power because their noses had a preferable shape. Well, in Sudan, um, you can see that it's pretty much two geographical areas, the Sahara Desert in the north and um, the beautiful, lush, one of the richest agricultural areas in the south, which is the vast Nile Valley. The Nile River runs 1,500 miles through the Sudan up into Egypt. It's considered one of the richest agricultural areas in the world in the south. And um, the geography pretty much uh, is similar to the demographics. People in the north are of Arab Muslim descent, uh, lighter skinned than the people in the south who are the black African tribes. Um, mostly the Dinka and Nuer, considered the tallest, darkest people in the world. And over in the west, which is about the side of California, right over, right over there, that is Darfur. It means, Darfur means of the fur in Arabic, and that's where they, where they live, and they are also of African descent. So um, this wasn't a country at all. 
until England put a border around it in 1898, and thrust these two people together. Um, when they ruled, all of the power, all of the development, all of the education was given to the people in the North. And the South was actually sealed off. So in 1956, when colonialism fell out of favor, they left peacefully, but they left the power in the hands of the people of the North. A very inequitable situation. They're the majority, um, they'd had all the development, and the oppression started then. And I don't want to go through the years of oppression, but um, it was never, it was never right. And there were some conflicts over it. But another thing happened in 1974. And uh, that was uh, technology of satellite imaging began to be very helpful uh, to us in finding oil. And through satellite imaging, the, um, in the CIA, George W. Bush Sr. was uh, over that body at the time, informed Sudan and the leaders of Sudan, which was Numeri at the time, or even before that, that um, they suspect there's more oil in Sudan than Saudi Arabia. So we were very excited about that, and so were they. And in 1974, Chevron Oil went in and started drilling. Now the oil, though, is not where the brown desert is. It's in the south where the black African tribes live. So the oil was not under the people in power, it was under the other people. And when you drill oil, it's very disturbing to whoever is there, whether it's the Arctic wildlife in Alaska, or it's African villagers who have been there for hundreds of years. These were not nomads, they had farms, they had cattle, and they'd been there maybe thousands of years. And uh, to drill the oil, to explore for the oil, they moved vast numbers of people away. And um, it's not like our government where you go through court and there's eminent domain and you get paid a nice price for your house and you go move over to Canoga Park or something. No, they were at gunpoint run away. And when they fought back, the government came in with bombers and helicopter gunships to protect the oil fields because the money was going into the pocket of the government. So they wanted Chevron to be able to drill safely. And so did we. So we funded that government in the mid-1980s. You know, and it took me a while to figure all of this out. It's all on the internet. There's lots of places you can find this kind of information. But at first glance, you hear things like you did. 60 Minutes is a great show. But there wasn't that inf much information available to people at the time about this situation. And um, the simple explanation of Muslims killing Christians seemed to make sense, right? You could also say it has a lot to do with race, and yes, it does. But really, I think those things are the things that divide them, but the motive is oil. Um, Chevron was in there drilling for 20 years until 1994 when finally it became um, politically unpopular and it just wasn't worth the expense. Canada was there till 2002. Um, oil is still being drilled, a vast amount. Anybody know who's now taking the oil out? China. China, yes. And so the bottom line is, now China is funding this new genocide there is um, a tentative peace agreement between the North and South um, due to probably pressure being put on the international uh, community um, through refugees like Benjamin speaking out about what's going on um, and trying to make people aware of it. But when that happened, the people over in the West, Darfur, there's also oil under the ground there, no surprise, said, we want to be part of this peace agreement because part of the peace agreement is oil revenue sharing so that they can develop the country, so they can build schools and roads and bridges and those sorts of things. And when they protested too loudly, the government simply moved all of the military equipment, not all of it, but a lot of it, over to Darfur and have been killing the people in, a hor in horrible ways. The atrocities are unspeakable ever since. And one of the ways they do it, besides the heavy military equipment, is they recruit a free army. And that's what they've been doing. 
And that's where religion comes in. It's a great tool when you want to put the Kalashnikov in the hand of somebody and tell them it's okay to go kill their neighbors. And that's what they're doing in Darfur. But the thing that also adds a strange twist to this is the people in Darfur are African, but they've been Muslim for hundreds of years. So in this case, it's really Muslims killing Muslims, which calls into question that whole situation, is it, is it over religion or not? Um, so, does, if anybody knows the name of um, the president of Sudan, you know those boys that didn't have newspapers, televisions, libraries? They knew that our president's name, right? Nobody knows? I'll give you a free book. <laughs> well, his name is, don't forget today, it's easy too. His name, are, his name is Omar al-Bashir. He's been in power for 20 years. And um, the most of the oil revenue from China goes into his pocket. And 70% of the oil revenue doesn't go to schools and the kinds of things we like to spend most of it on. It goes to military equipment to kill his own people. He doesn't have outside enemies. So uh, what can we do about this? Um, I brought some flyers up here. Uh, it's, you know, it's in a face of a situation like this, it's hard to know what to do. But one of the things that we can do, and the internet is a super powerful tool, and everybody has access to it, is China's the one buying all the oil. And so, I don't know if any of you saw in the newspaper um, last week that Steven Spielberg quit as producer of the Olympics. There's a, a huge movement on to embarrass China on their One World, One Dream Olympics and to quit funding this genocide. They don't need to buy that oil from Sudan. It's only 5% of the oil that they do buy. So I think that's one way that we as individuals can have impacts. There's also a way you can go in and send a letter to your representative because we are a representative government and we do have more voice by contacting our congressional representative. And if you don't know who it is, don't worry because this website's like a video game. You click on your state, you click on your city, and it gives a grade in terms of how well your representative has been doing on the Darfur issue. So there's a lot of things that can be done. So that's kind of a background to the situation. Um, just want you to know it's still going on today. It's complicated and uh, we are um, oftentimes have a huge impact on people a very far way away from us. It isn't just global warming that, import, that oil impacts, it's also children and the children are still suffering. So now I'd like to introduce you to my co-author, Benjamin. Um, you pretty much saw a lot of background to his story. He was five years old in 1987 uh, when his village was attacked in southern Sudan. And he came here to America in 2001. So I'm really honored to introduce you to him now. I think afterwards we're gonna burn some books in. Yeah, I forgot to, let me just, uh, Benjamin hasn't rested since he's been here. <laughs> he's done a lot of jobs, but he also uh, wrote his memoir with his brother and uh, about the story of his life. So here you are. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Yes, uh, my name is Benjamin Najak. I'm the co-author of that book. So, actually, that book is good for you young guys here because it gives you the basic understanding of how a young man or a young lady can struggle for the life that he will or she will achieve for the future. So, um, see, you guys just watched that little documentary which was giving you guys a basic understanding of how life was like back in the days when I was in Africa. So. Maybe some of you like some part of it, and maybe some of you don't like. So I think before I proceed with the program, so just tell me what part you like in that little documentary so we can talk about it, or I can tell you why it's not supposed to be like or why you like it. So the question is for you. Tell me what you like on that little documentary. 
Yes. That you survived. Yeah. Good. Struggling of survival. <coughs> Another one. Yes. I like the fact that one of them was trying to kind of say he said that was second heaven to him. That was pretty. That's pretty inspiring. How they think just to come. Okay. Second. Yes. Friendships and um, the understanding that uh, they would be together and try to forge a new life here. Yes, that's the last question. So she said she liked um, our life cooperation or the cooperative of life. So, yes, that was the main one for us because we have to cooperate. We don't have parents to protect us. So, yes, um, in 1987, when I was five years old, seeing you seen that attack in the villages, Benjamin was living his beautiful life in an African hut with his mother and a father. Mother, um, my father is a very happy man in his uh, and his family. He's married to eight wives, and he owned them all in that little area. And then the attack came in. I lost my childhood in there. So when I lost my childhood, me. My father and my mother were killed in his spot. So that caused me to flee the country to, um, to Ethiopia, where I lived for two years. On the way to Ethiopia, the life wasn't good to me. Why? Because I don't have my father and a mother to take care of me. Seeing you kids like to, uh, to base on your, your mother and father because when you need something to eat and you can't afford to get it somewhere, you need it to go to the, your mother or your father and ask what can I eat, uh, what can I do to get something to eat. But for me, there's no food, no water, no uh, no shoes, walking bare food, and not even clothes on me. I was naked. I walk in the middle of the night during the days. Spent all this time on my track to Ethiopia, feeding myself on wet mud to keep my throat wet, um, uh, making my system circulations possible. Every time I need to circulate myself, what I mean by that is like what uh, Paul said, we have to drink our own urine. So Benjamin is here drinking a bottle of water down there, and I before drank my own urine during the track. So and I'm still alive. I was hunting for life. So when I met my life uh, going on in Ethiopia, for the two years we've been there, so there is a revolution in Ethiopia, which, and we have Ethiopia still. So that revolution caused another movement so we can move back to Sudan. Where, where we walk back because uh, the, the Gila rivers took a lot of life from us, which is 2,000 boys. Why? Because a river, a crossing of that river wasn't organized. And uh, that river was so dangerous. Why? Three things. Uh, random swimming took a lot of boys' lives. What I mean by random swimming is when people are getting fired, they're shooting on us. So we have to dive in randomly. If you dive in first, I dive on you. And somebody dived on me. And you know, when somebody is under the water for almost uh, 35 seconds, you need to come up and catch up with your breath. So 35 seconds go, go to 50 to 60 to the minute. And you know, you cannot stay under the water with no safety. You have to drown. Also, for the shooting, if you're not lucky the bullet fell on you in the water, you will not be existing anymore. Also, was a hungry crocodile that was sitting in that river for nothing to eat. He's not feeding himself or herself with a human flesh. So that's why the river was so dangerous for us. And we still live it for the survivors like me who escaped that. Make it back to Sudan in a town called Peshala. And our government, who is going against us, has realized that boys came back to Sudan. So he need to accomplish his mission. So for him to finish the job, he's still sending his military jets and helicopter gun ship to come and drop bombs on us. In the middle of the night and during the days, we don't have chance uh, to recover our life. 
We don't have chance. But what we can do to reclaim our parents back since we lost them. We have nothing to eat even, but luckily the time was a rainy season. So we have to feed ourselves dry fruits and white leaves that are possible to be consumed. For the last six months we've been in Pashala, we have to think of what we can do. Actually, we were lucky that we have a rebel leader named John Grant, who just died in 2004 in a helicopter crash. He has, um, uh, uh, he has plans, if he can at least talk to the care of former president of Kenya, whose name, Daniel Trotisha Ramoy, also was United Nations AIDS officers. If they can let us go over Kenya, uh, border so we can live there as a refugee. A former president said, please let the boys come for their refuge in my country. We were so excited to go to Kenya for our, our self-recovery and our self-determination to survive. So we went to Kenya. Walking to Kenya was another uh, disaster for us because there are some local people that can attack us on our way. Why? Because they need our own belongings. If you have at least one piece of clothes that you put your heart on it, that that's my favorite clothes, they need it. For them to come and ask you in an official way that let me have that clothes and I'll let you go, they think of killing you and pick up the stuff after, after you're gone. So, and some boys that don't, uh, don't like the sound of gun, when they hear some, some guns coming up, and ter terrible sounding, somebody fell down, they, they give up their belongings, they throw away their bags and take off their shoes if they were lucky and then they run by themselves. So when you're running away with nothing in your hand, they let you go. For me, Benjamins, if you guys can see me here, I'm not healthy enough. Um, spiritually, physically, and maybe mentally. Because why I say that is, for all this uh, struggling I've been through, when I think about my parents that I lost when I was five, and I think about my beautiful country that I gave up for the refuge coming to the United States and all those borders I've been over with them. Also, for the life I went through walking over those mountains at night, what I consumed, always getting sick, I think that was a God illumination. When God picked me as an example of this great world, I can do what God asked me to do. God chose me as an example for people that that is supposed to be me with those boys that he heard they are over there in some part of the country in America. I'm not the only one that's chosen, but for the job I'm doing and for the great country of America that's chosen me to bring me over to the United States, I think my job here is to say thank to America and to continue my business of telling you guys and teaching you guys that this is what was going on back in the day in my life. Why? Me, Benjamin, I was so silently suffering and no one over here is standing up to speak up on behalf of me. But when I'm choosing to come to America as an example for those who can speak up for their country or for those who can come to the United States and do something to make their country go better again. That's why I put myself into this with some other lost boys that are working so hard to bring the country back. I sat down with my, country, uh, my cousins who wrote that book and that book was a memoir. And it is a true story about my life and about my cousins. And that book is good for you young folks to read it. Where I say, you young folks, it's not because um, I'm too old for you, but maybe all of you here are below 25, and I'm 25. So it's good for you. It's not according to the politics. There is no politi uh, politics in it. And I'm not influencing you from your good brain you have to the, uh, to the bad reading that I put. This is good for your life and for your experience. That's why I sat down, tried to put an awareness to you guys so you can understand what is going on for the last uh, 25 years of living.
some of the boys are doing documentaries too in writing and putting them in a, in a, a, a slideshow. For me to come to America, I was thinking that my expectation to the United States was just going to be good. But no, when I came here back in 2001, my first view or my first experience in the United States was well Trade Center on fire. And when I saw that on fire, our plane <coughs> was diverted back to Canada. We had to go to Canada for two weeks. Why? Because international borders were shut down. There was no plane coming to JFK. So when I go to Canada, I still cry and I say, okay, always the world is following me. When I need to go to some places that have no war, I have to get war there. So the United States war with Iraq began when I came here. And before, there was no war. So, and I think now when I grew up and I went to school, I realized that everywhere you go, there is a problem. There is no good place to live normally. Everywhere you go, you face some uh, different stuff. So, when I came to San Diego, I lived in San Diego for almost seven years now. Next September 11, I'll be seven years in San Diego. But for the uh, last six years I've been in San Diego, I go to school, San Diego Community College. You know, and uh, maybe some of you here will say, it's too hard to ride when you come from a different country. And I know I've seen a lot of you guys' faces here. You guys, uh, maybe uh, some of your backgrounds are from your migrant. Maybe you were born here, or maybe you just moved here with your parents when, or while you grew up somewhere, and then started your education here. There is nothing is hard to do when you need to do something. If you're in school, you really want to be a writer, you really want to be an English speaker, you really want to be uh, um, something else in school. If you need to do it, it's not hard. It's easier if you need it. So some of you here, maybe you guys are sitting here, you tired, getting up every morning, go to work, or getting up every morning, come to school, and then later on go to work. Don't think of doing one thing. Keep doing what you do and come to school, go to work, because maybe some of you are here with a student visa, or some of you are here uh, to study and go back again to your countries later on. This is the best way to do it here if you're looking forward to go back to your country. Give yourself a hard time, like what you're doing now. Later on, we'll turn back to you. The hard time you had before, it's going to be a good time you will get tomorrow. Why I say that is, maybe you, you are here, you're Native American, that were born here and raised here, you're still in the school. This education too is for you. I'm not advising you to go to school, but I'm telling you, I, I'm encouraging you to do what you're doing. A school in America is better because all jobs you do, they need that certificate you got out from the school. With no certificate, you will do a level job. And I think you can't sit in a school for 12 years, 14 years, and still go out there and do a level job. That means what you were in a school for is, um, uh, is not done. You need to go back again. Um, and when you go to school, you choose one particular thing to go and study so you can come and do. When, when you become a professor of it, or when you become a doctor of it, even the PhD holders, they have things that they study that they can go and do, not all these. You cannot become a mathematic teacher, you cannot become an English teacher, you cannot become a grammar, because English have two English. Grammar and, uh, and uh, <laughs> okay. So I'm going so far, but uh, I'm running out of time now. Let me come back, so some of you last, like your teacher said earlier that Benjamin liked to travel across the United States. That's one of the students told me when I was in Greenboro, uh, North Carolina last week. So they say, uh, where do you live? I say, I live in San Diego. They say, do you like traveling? Well, from there all the way to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't like traveling, but when I'm teaching you what you don't know is why I travel, because not too many people know my life story. So I have to teach you guys my life story. I'm running out of time, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me this morning. And I appreciate your listening. Uh, your library will have a good time later on. Uh,
I'll see you in another particular question and ask you and thank you all. Yes, I'll give you guys a little time for the questions and uh, and please do not be so afraid. Sometimes some students say, if I ask my question, my question is going to be silly to some other listeners. There is no silly question around this world. All the questions that we ask is what you don't know, so you can know. Do not be afraid. If I walk out that door, I'm going all the way to San Diego because I'm <laughs> thinking doing downtown today. <laughs> question for you. Yes, speak up so we can hear. you've already answered this, but I was wondering, do you find it difficult to form close friendships here in the United States when people's lives, especially um, people your age, their lives are so different here? Yes, um, yes, getting adjust to this life is hard for me. Why? Because when I was in Africa, what they tell you when you need to leave is different from what you can get here. Otherwise, I would have not met Judy as my, 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 my friend or as my uh, mentor. They say, if you go to America, watch out from those American ladies. <laughs> okay, because when they see you around, American ladies come around you and pull out the gun and point it at you when you ask someone else, say, if you're not marrying me, I'll kill you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when I came here, first time I saw Judy, she called me. She was driving around the city. Actually, she was coming out from my cousin's house, and she just stopped at the light. She saw me, and she called my name, and I was walking down the street with my, uh, one of my friends. He just moved to Ohio State. So she called me Benjamin. When I looked into that car, I saw that lady. <laughs> and I thought about what they say back in Africa. <laughs> <what happened. laughs> I don't want to talk to her. I keep walking away. <laughs> but she said, I know your, your cousin, Lino, Benson, and Afo. I'll tell you to them. I said, no, I'm walking to them. <laughs> <laughs> and and my, uh, that friend of mine said, that is Judy. I know her. She's um, a good friend to your cousin. I said, OK. She turned around. She just stopped. And I told my homeboy that, hey, go, 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 go and sit in the front seat. And I will sit behind her. <laughs> when she pulled out that gun, I will see and I will stop. <laughs> So it was so hard, but I just see a little bit, a little bit. I learned how to do this. So I think, I said, ah, medical ladies are good. I'm not going to be afraid of them. Yeah, so sorry for walking me so late. There are some changes every time. So next time when you heard about that, come be punctual. You have to come a little bit early. So, <laughs> so you cannot cut off all this program that they did earlier before you were not here. I'm so sorry about that, too. Any other questions? Sometimes when you see us that don't know about what is going on, when you see how we take what we have for granted, because I think a lot of, I know I did, I took what we have for granted. Well, you know, it doesn't make me mad when I speak about my life story or when I speak about the people that don't know uh, what they are doing. I like it. Why? Because while we come here, have an example, just for example, for that, we come to school is to learn. Our teachers, they don't get mad that why, why you don't know. You come to school to learn what you don't know. So for me, it is the great adventure for me to tell people what they don't know all the time. I can sit here 24-7 telling you again and again and again my life story over and over. And I'm not going to stop if you still need me to tell you more. I don't get mad at all. So it doesn't make me 
uh, felt sorry in my life. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, first, I just wanted to say I really uh, appreciate you uh, just being here with us. Today. It's truly uh, just an honor. And, um, you know, as a as a uh, young you know African American male in this country, you know, I'm the same age as you. There is clearly um, there's a gap in between the Africans in Africa and the African Americans here that reside here. And I just wanted, you know, to ask you, you know, uh, I guess why you feel like that might exist and uh, as well what, what do you think about, you know, the African Americans that are here? Did, did you find a lot of resentment, you know, to the African Americans here of the United States? And, and as well, to close out the question, you know, what do you feel like we can do to kind of bridge that gap that we kind of have with each other? Good. Um, when they say he's African American, it's because they are not African. It's because they were born here. Why they call me African is because I was born there and I just immigrated recently. So here in America, I heard a lot of different names, but they end up with America. They have Latino Americans, African American, Mexican American, Cuban American, uh, Japanese American, Chinese American, Korean American. <laughs> and now they call me Sudanese American. <laughs> because I live here. So why uh, they call you African American, it's not there is a gap between African and African American. Not at all. It's just uh, a name they give out because even a white folk, you see, they have Irish Americans. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of it, but it doesn't make that even Jews American they hear. It doesn't make that for them, just a name that is given. So I, I don't see no gap at all. It's just because sometimes people they don't take their name as seriously. For me, I felt proud if I go find some jobs when I see. The job application say, what is your ethnic? White, African American, Mexican, Hispanic. I have no name in there. I say African American. Because that's who I am. So it's just a name that is given. Doesn't make no guess. So thank you for that. Yes. Uh, your story is truly inspirational. I know that you were talking about uh, going to school and when you arrived here, well, you know, the planes that kind of, were there any particular moments, kind of markers where you said, you know what, because you said that, you know, war kind of chased you, especially as a child, when you began to think that things are like meeting Judy's, like, you know, this is one of the moments that things are definitely getting better, where there are any, any of those? Um, like I said earlier, for 9-11 has destroyed all my expectation of the United States, you know, I would think that coming to the United States, it's an easy thing for me, and it's going to give me an easy life. I was expecting I would get some, somebody, some rich man in here, <laughs> would build me a house free. <laughs> <laughs> and one of you rich men here will go to that dealer and buy me a, a brand new Escalade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and I was expecting in the United States, I was not going to hear no gunshots no more. Because I'm so tired of gunshots. Yeah. But when I came in, think my husband, they all fall apart. You know? And uh, I said, okay, war is chasing me now. What can I do? When I came here, no one built me a house. No one bought me a car. So I say, hey, this is an easy life now. Look at me. I've been struggling over there. I think if I struggle here too, life will be easy for me. 
And guess what, man? I struggled so hard here in America. All the jobs that America does or does, I did all of them. I did movies. I cleaned toilets. I drove trucks across the country. Um, I purified water. I deliver beer in the store. All those jobs. I do construction. All of these. Except I've never been a policeman before. <laughs> but all these jobs, except a pilot or running for president, all of them, never done those. But anything you do with a hand, uh, just to build my own foundation. So when I came, the only thing that clicked in my mind was why the war chased me. And it doesn't make anything changed in all the expectation. Got it? Yes. Are you still very close to your cousins? And do you still have that same closeness, that friendship and camaraderie? Yes. Um, I'm very close to my cousins. Yes. Maybe they are at home right now waiting for me in my house. So they come to my house every day. And also they leave, they leave a Closer to me, I'll go to their house sometime. So yes, we're still close. Every Saturday and Sunday, we're together. But during the business hours, weekly like this, everybody's minding their own business. They're working for their pocket money. And I'm working here for my pocket money. No one is sleeping. We have to work hard for our lives. But we are still close though. Thank you. How much time we still have? Okay, two more questions. One. At what age did you discover that an American company was contributing to the problems in your country? And when you discovered that, what were your thoughts in regards to that? Okay. I don't know what age I was in 1998. That's when I realized that America, they tried to help Southern Sudan now by taking some of those lost boys to the United States for their further education. That's the only best thing the American can do to Southern Sudan. Also, the United States has decided that they pour in a lot of uh, United Nations aids to Southern Sudan so they can help. These are building medicine, food, and even shelters. And everything that I have over there, except some clothes, they all have United States, USA on it. A tin of, um, a tin of oils, all, a bag of the food, they have all USA on it. Even a bundle of blankets. I said, okay, now I'm going to USA. That's, that's when I thought everything is free over in the U.S. <laughs> because everything I get there with the U.S. on it, they're free. <laughs> so, yes, in 1998, I don't know how, I don't know how old I was, was I, but that's when I discovered that. One more question, or yes. over to the United States because as soon as you come here you go through counseling and uh, 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 job training all of those so they can adjust you in American life so but the most counseling the very understandable counseling came through us by ourselves what we do every weekend we go to church 
That church called St. Luke. We buy all the games. Dominoes, cards, playing cards, and scrambles. All those games have been Ludo and, uh, and Chase. So we can play. They just bring a good crowd. You know, some people make jokes. Some people play. They, they're waiting there because we have to lease everybody. Everybody need to play for scrambles. They list themselves. Dominoes, they list themselves. So everybody come uh, according to categories. Uh, there. We don't think about anything. We feel like we're still at home when we come uh, when we come together. But when you go to work every Monday to Friday, you mind about your job. You don't mind about your problem back home. When you come back, some people mind about their own schools. They're never done with the homework. They need to go to school in an hour. So when you come back, you mind about going to work tomorrow. So get ready to eat. Take shower, go to bed. So there was no shot for that. And uh, every Sunday we have to go for meetings. Who is not doing that? Who is not doing that? Because last time we came here, the last meeting we did, we did a meeting over those who were having a hard time getting a job. And they're struggling now. They're looking for one because we asked them. I cannot, <coughs> I cannot support you every week. And you have to work. Seeing we Sudanese, we have a, a say to America. We say, as soon as you have a social security, you have a lot of bills. <laughs> <laughs> That's the say we make. <laughs> because for those who have social securities, they have bills coming. Medical bills. Uh, um, uh, Island bills, like they say, Uncle Sam, need to be paid back for the airfare ticket. And maybe you just miss driving, speeding, and they give you a ticket, they track you down through your social security. <laughs> they know where you are, they send you that check to be paid back to Superior Court. So whenever you have social security, you have to find a job so you can fulfill those bills. And you know in America, if you don't take care of your bills, you're going where? You go to jail. So, yes, uh, thank you so much all, and we'll see you around. Um, if you have some questions that you would like to ask personally, and also we're going to have Judy and Benjamin sit up here at this table in the front, and you can bring the novel if you have purchased it, and get it signed today. I'm not sure if we have others. We only had three left in the bookstore. So we had, you have some, good. We also have some here. So if you'd like to purchase a book today and have it signed, that would be great. So I'm going to invite you now to come down to the front, those of you who'd like to get it signed, or if you have a question, if they have time for any short um, questions at that time. Thank you all for coming. And again, we have an event next Tuesday. And we have the Women's Shakespeare Company coming. This is going to be very interesting because it's sort of like a, a little uh, flop, you know. In Shakespearean days, only men could play the roles of actors. And this whole company is a company of women. And it should be a marvelous experience as well. Cool. So come and see us um, on Tuesday of next week. And come on down. Thank you very much for coming. I have these information sheets about what you might want to do. And there's some free bookmarks down here if you'd like to, so. This is a student of mine, Benjamin. See how she abuses me? Thank you, Benjamin. They should have more in the evenings. It's true. Yes, they should. No, it's not what it's an honor. I think another reason I'm really going to be informed is because I just feel this desire to, you know, to want to help. You know, like, you know, you know, like, what can I do? You know, type of thing. And, uh, well, feel you're welcome to your presence. I appreciate people that are in the Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Difference. Appreciate you coming down. Five.
Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Oh, we're glad you did it too. Judy, I wanted to ask you about um, yes, on the rent. Oh, thanks for calling me. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thanks for calling me back. You had called me about where and when it was. And that was so, on. Oh, that's okay. We're just so disappointed. So excited! I wanted to ask you about um, on the website it mentions speaking at book clubs. You read the book at a book club. Uh huh. Oh, great! Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, my um, math teacher was the one that told me that you guys did it. I didn't really know. Oh, no? No, I didn't see nothing on campus or anything. Wow. Sorry. I know. I feel so nervous. Okay. Now you got it. Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. How's it going? I thought we were having a trip. Oh, okay. I, uh, it's hard for me to do something. Are they doing all three meetings? Or I can't even do it. Oh, you're dark? Yeah, look alike. A lot of Ethiopian and Greek in the same name. But we're supposed to do the same thing. How you doing? Good, how are you? My son's name is Benjamin. Oh, five years old. That's when I tried to yeah, we were so moved. Can I take that? Enjoy it. Thank you very much. Good luck. Pleasure to meet you. Enjoyed the book, enjoyed your chapters. Oh, okay. Thank you. How many lost boys are there on the same page? No, we luckily didn't have to work. <laughs> you want a little bit of family then, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Why? Thank you for How's it going? You're going to meet Good. Benjamin? They came all the way from Pivot, and it was the wrong Pleasure. time on the website, so they missed it. Can you shake his hand? Oh, no. You want, to take, you want to have your picture taken with Benjamin? Yeah. We want to read this book to her later. <laughs> she might like the parts about the gold. Very pretty. Very pretty. Can you make him a funny face? Make a funny face. Make a funny face. Okay, we all ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for Thank coming. You. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. We'll see you at our book club. Uh, yeah, yes, I would so love to come. Okay. 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 Yeah. Do you have the book? Okay. 15. Okay. Do you need uh, no, yes. you got two? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, here's your file. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Oh, yes. Bye -bye. That, that, that's a How's it going? You know what? How are you? Yeah, you know, that's what you get. But I, I met them. I, I knew I was doomed that first 10 minutes. What about me? Thank you very much. You need $5 change. Thank you. 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 No? Would you like me to sign it? Uh, yes. What's your name?